Well, thank you all very much for allowing me to speak today and, and to talk with you, I hope, about a topic that you'll find I'm very passionate about. Uh, you heard I was on television for 17 years. The Mind is Powerful Medicine was the name of the piece. And uh, I, I remember a story uh, of, a, a physician, of a lawyer who came to see me with obsessive compulsive disorder. She was a compulsive hand washer. And when she came in, I told her, you know, I think what you need is medication and therapy. She was cool with the therapy, no medicine, no medicine. And I saw her for about three weeks, and each time I said, you know, you might do better with the medicine. She said, no medicine, no medicine. I'm okay with the therapy. And then one day she comes in and she says, okay, I'll take the medicine. And I said, well, great, but what made you decide to take the medicine now? She said, well, I was cooking dinner uh, the other day and the TV was on in the other room. The news came on at 10 o'clock and there was a doctor on the newscast who talked about this disease that you say I have, OCD. And the doctor on TV said, to do best, you ought to take medicine and therapy. So I'll take the medicine. <laughs> the doctor was me. On TV, she would listen to me. She was in the other room, didn't see me. And, and that's when I realized how powerful television is to tell the truth and to give misconceptions as well. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. One of the problems I found with, uh, on being, uh, about being on TV was that I could talk to people out there, but they couldn't talk back to me, and I couldn't hear their questions. And so today, I'm going to talk a little bit to you guys. So let me start with, what is it that you want to hear? You know the topic. It's about veterans, uh, PTSD, and employment. What is it that you would like to hear in the next hour? Any ideas, any thoughts that you might have? Any questions that you have that you want to make sure that I answer? Yeah. So the question is, why is it so difficult for therapists to give therapy, and, and especially in the civilian world? And, and I think part of it is that I'm, I'm not sure therapists are taught how to do that. I'm getting ready to embark, uh, I'm doing 13 continuing medical education programs around the United States for physicians, primary care civilian physicians. And believe it or not, they don't know much about PTSD. Uh, that's part of it. Part of it is, uh, uh, I think they're frightened because of some of the myths and misconceptions that we all have. So, we'll talk about those. Yeah. How prevalent is it in the uh, military folks leaving the service today? Are there various levels of PTSD? Uh, uh, the question is, how common is it amongst people leaving the service today, whether they've served in the Middle East or not? Uh, and the second question was? Are there oh, are there various levels? And I promise you I'll address both those questions in the talk. So, yeah. We being, in a workplace. yeah, how can fellow employees, supervisors, HR people, EAPs, how can we work with them? And that's part of the talk as well. So let me tell you what my goals are for the next hour. I, I'm going to talk to you about the why, what, when, uh, how part. So the why is, why do we want to hire veterans anyhow? The second, the what is, what are the potential stumbling blocks in doing that? The how is, how do we overcome those? And the when is, when should we start? And when we do it right, what are the benefits, anyhow, of working with veterans? So, I, I want to start with the why. 
Why do we want to hire vets anyhow? What's the big deal? Well, th there are certain reasons uh, that you can read about in, in all of the newspapers and magazines. Things like, uh, vets deserve a break. After all, they've served for us. And how about this one? Uh, you get tax breaks if you're a business for hiring vets. That might be a reason. How about this one? It feels good to hire a vet. And what about this one? It's the right thing to do. And then there's this one. It's good for the vet, good for the community, and good for the country. So all those things are true. None of them are probably the right reasons that we ought to be hiring veterans. And I'm going to talk to you about what those right reasons are. So, the right reasons, according to a survey done by Sherm, have to do with certain attributes that veterans possess. For example, veterans have shown they can learn. They have to pass basic training, they have to pass advanced training, they have to learn new things every day. Secondly, they've learned to work with others and work in teams, and that's critically important in the military and should be in the civilian world as well. Third, they've demonstrated a dedication to the mission, to the goal, to the job, to getting it done. And that's important in the military and the civilian world as well. And they've shown they can work within a specified time frame to get the job done. And sometimes that's even longer than eight hours a day to get the job done. And they're used to working those long hours in the military. In addition, many have managerial, administrative, and project management skills all great attributes in the civilian world. They've demonstrated their ability to identify problems and their solutions. And whoop, they've shown they can succeed because they've made it thus far. And all those are very positive attributes that must be wanted or must be uh, uh, appreciated by the companies they hire them. Because we've seen it's going on now. Goodyear's hiring and uh, Disney's hiring, 1,000 in 10 years. And Walmart is planning to employ 100,000 veterans over the next five years. So it's already happening now. But what are the potential stumbling blocks and that's what we're here today to talk about. Some of them that you're probably aware of are these. This is a survey from the Human Resource Association, SHRM. 22% of employers believed that combat-related disabilities posed problems in hiring veterans. 22%, one in five. That's not so good, but look at this. In terms of mental challenges, if they have some sort of emotional problem, psychological problem, or others, that number doubled. So half of employers said it might be a hindrance to hire somebody uh, with an emotional challenge. And what's the biggest emotional challenge that uh, employers worry about, it's this guy here, PTSD, PTSD. And I'm going to go over with you some of the misconceptions, the stigma, the myths that produce the stigma about PTSD. So what is it? Well, most, most people, if you believe the myths, say it's this mind-altering illness that causes people to act in strange and, and probably uh, difficult ways in the workplace. It is primarily at its base, the myth says, 
It is primarily a psychiatric problem, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Who has PTSD? Well, since you can't ask when you're hiring someone unless they want accommodations, the assumption probably is that everybody in the military has PTSD. Or certainly everyone coming back from combat has PTSD. Neither of those are true, by the way. And it is not limited to those in the military. So that all of us, if we experience the right kind of stressor, may develop PTSD, whether we've ever served in the military or not. The, the stats, by the way, I'm going to answer that question. The stats for people coming back from combat areas with PTSD show that what percentage have PTSD? 10, 20, 40, 50, 80? How much? Give me an idea. Over 50. Over 50. What else? Who else has an idea? The stats are 20. One in five. One out of five who have been in a combat area come back with PTSD. And by the way, PTSD is not only related to combat areas. What about in the workplace? What are the myths about PTSD in the workplace? People with PTSD are what? in the workplace. Say again? Disruptive. Disruptive. They're unpredictable. And at worst, they're violent. I'll show you the data on that too, because none of those are true as well. So what are the major symptoms of PTSD in the workplace? Let me begin by telling you why I'm talking to you about this at all. I'm going to take you back to 1973. I was in charge of the Army's drug and alcohol program at Fort Sam Houston. Vietnam ended in 1973, formally in 1975. And tragically, we never lacked for people to fill our drug and alcohol beds. This was Nixon's showcase program to the world. And we always had people flying in, looking over our programs. And all, all, all of the people filling our beds had what we would now call PTSD. But in 1973, PTSD had no name. It didn't get its name till 1980. And more importantly than not having a name, we didn't have a clue what to do for these folks, except give them a lot of useless advice. Things like, stop smoking all that dope. Stop drinking so much. Stop being angry all the time. Get some friends, get a family, get a job, get a life, get a grip. All of which was terrible advice, and I knew it at that time. Fast forward to 12 years ago, I started seeing veterans for disability evaluations. I've now seen over 7,000 vets, and because I was so interested in what they had to say, not only did I gather the data for the evaluation, I actually listened to them. And for the first time, many vets opened up to me about what they had kept inside for 30 years or longer. And what I learned was, even back then, 12 years ago when I started, we talked about PTSD like everybody knows what that is. But these veterans didn't know what it was. Believe it or not, many of them had not a clue why they did the stuff they did. They just did it. And their families couldn't understand it either, but those that stuck with them just grew to accept. Well, that's how he or she is. And so I started working on a little manuscript, and the little manuscript uh, had uh, uh, information about PTSD. And the vets would say, when they read it, how did you know me? And I'd say, hell, I didn't know you. But I do know PTSD, and that's what you suffer from. So this is the book that came as a result of that. I always sit with my back to the wall. Those of you with PTSD will understand the title immediately. The rest, I'll explain it in just a moment. But on the book tour for the book, I started getting questions about employment. I hadn't anticipated that. That wasn't my area of expertise. 
But over the last several years, I, I've read more and more and talked to more and more, not only employers, not only the VA, but EAPs as well, and that's the information I'm going to give you here. So, what is PTSD? PTSD is at its basic core a response that we have to stressor, to a stressor, a traumatic stressor. Now, most of us have probably had traumatic stressors in our life. Maybe not combat, maybe it was an airplane that, uh, that wasn't acting right in the sky and the pilot said, we're going to have some trouble. Maybe it was walking in a dark alleyway and hearing noises and being frightened. Maybe it was something even more than that. What do those type of experiences cause us to feel like and think like? What's it like? when you have a traumatic stress. Like say you're almost mugged, not quite, or the, the mugger is chased away. You don't get hurt, but you get mugged. What, what, what's that? What do you feel like when you experience a traumatic stress? What are the physical symptoms you have during that stress? Fight, flight, and, and what does that feel like, fight or flight? You have anxiety everywhere, your head is going, you're worrying. What's happened to your body? Elevated heart rate, your heart is click, 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 click. What else is happening? What else is happening? You're scared. Now, let's say nothing big happens to you, right? How long does that feeling last? Hours? Days? Does it last months? Does it last years? Probably not. And that's one of the things that differentiates just normal stress, even if it's traumatic, from post-traumatic stress stressor. Because see, the stressor in post-traumatic stress is big. It's big. So PTSD is like what I've just described to you on steroids. It's much bigger than that and much longer lasting. So, according to the book, DSM, which by the way, for those of you watching the Jody Arias trial who wonders, what does DSM stands for? It stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric. We're now on version 4TR, and in May, just two months from now, uh, version 5. DSM-5 will be out, so I'm going to show you what DSM-5 will say. So the stressor that leads to PTSD is being exposed to events that involve death or threaten death, serious injury, or severe sexual violation, right? So you either experience those you're close and witness somebody else next to you experiencing one of those events, or they added this this year, uh, you learned about uh, either a close relative or friend experiencing that, or you had repeated exposure to the event, like on TV, and this was put in for the 9-11 survivors, the police and fire first responders who had repeated exposure to what they saw. So, PTSD, oop, can you make that go forwards? Ah, stands for post, again, traumatic, again, stress, and then I put some question marks, because many of you have heard the question marks. What do we call it? Is it post-traumatic stress disorder? Is it just post-traumatic stress? Is it post-traumatic something? What is it? What do we call it? And there's a lot of controversy now, as you know, about what to call it. Is it a disorder? Is it a war wound? What is it that we call it? And frankly, I don't think it makes much difference in the big picture, what we call it. 
it depends a lot more, it, it makes a lot more difference what, what we understand it to be and what we do about it. Next. At its core, PTSD is not, is not a psychiatric disorder. Why do I make such a big deal about that? Because most people think of a psychiatric disorder as something you can control if you really want to or if you're strong enough to, right? PTSD is at its core, and I'm going to explain that now, a biologic disorder, not a psychological one. I'm going to explain what PTSD is to you. I'm going to explain it by using what we use in the book. It's, it's an example called Upstairs, Downstairs. I hope it's not too simplified, but I use this in describing to physicians how to explain PTSD uh, to their patients. So, let's imagine the brain, and this is a, a cutoff of the brain, in the middle. So it's down the center of the head, and now you're looking at the side. So there's an upstairs part. See the upstairs, that? That's called the cortex. Actually, it's called the prefrontal cortex, and that's where our highest centers of learning are located. That's where our verbal skills are located, in the upstairs, the cortex. The downstairs is called the limbic system, and that's where our response to stress and our emotions, many of them are located. And then in the basement is located the maintenance man who takes care of things like the plumbing, the electricity, the air conditioning, the water, and so forth. So who lives at the upstairs of this major corporation? Who stays up there? Well, whose offices are found up there? The CEO, right? The CEO, the big guy, his offices are found in the upstairs. Now, the CEO is a very bright feller. He understands the big picture. He knows it all. But he's slow. He's slow because he's got to consider everything before making a decision. And so he's kind of slow. And frankly, he's not that young either. So he's kind of used to using fax machines and slow computers that he knows how to operate. He doesn't use all this fast stuff. But he's the guy with the big picture, right? Now, what happens in times of crisis or stress. So let's say that there's an immediate threat to you. The CEO begins to think about a lot of stuff. Let's use, for example, you're now a soldier in Afghanistan, and you're walking on patrol, and from the top of a building, you hear movement. Is that the enemy? Is that a rifle? Is that wind just blowing through? Is that anything I need to worry about? What is it? That's what the CEO is thinking. If, if he thinks it all through and says, well, it's probably not that, it might be that, it might be that, I got to make sure because I don't want to get the company sued. So he's thinking but it takes too long. And if it's the enemy, you're dead. So what happens is there's a downstairs part. We call that the limbic system. The limbic system is the old brain. It's found in mammals, animals. It, it goes back thousands and thousands of years. And it's what protects animals and humans from threat. So there's three parts of the limbic system. One part is the alert management system. That alert man is called the amygdala. And the amygdala, amygdala by the way means almond because it's shaped like a little almond. And so the amygdala is what alerts everything that there's danger, potential danger out there. And he gives the message over there to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is, is the management driver of the risk 
department. And the hypothalamus is what sets into motion all the electrical activities and the hormones and the brain chemicals that then go down to the maintenance guy so that the maintenance guy can operate what he or she needs to. At the same time, there's all kind of messages going up to the brain. But remember, the CEO is old, and he uses old equipment. And so he may not get all the messages that are coming up. He may get only certain parts of certain messages. But there's a part of this downstairs system that gets all the messages. That part is called the records management department. That is the hippocampus. Hippocampus means seahorse-like, because it looks like a little seahorse. So the hippocampus records everything. So during stress, during this incident in Afghanistan, every single thing is being recorded in the hippocampus. All the smells, all the sounds, all the sights, the temperature, the way it feels under one's feet, and so forth. It's being all recorded. But remember, verbal activity takes place in the cortex, where the CEO lives. And those messages are being delayed in getting up here, and they may not get up there at all. So what happens is, parts of those messages may get up there from time to time. That's what nightmares are all about, ladies and gentlemen. That's what flashbacks are all about. Only partial messages are getting up, a flash, a glimmer. That's what triggers are all about. Have you ever wondered, do you have any friends with PTSD? I mean, they do things that don't make any sense. You know, they're walking down San Antonio, the street, and all of a sudden, they hear a noise, and what do they do? They jump. They may hit the ground. They may be embarrassed. They, they smell a smell. It's, it's just a barbecue pit, for God's sakes. Maybe the meat's burning a little bit. And they go nuts. Why? Because the hippocampus remembers that smell from Afghanistan, remembers that sound. And so, in the streets of San Antonio, things are happening that make sense if we understand this but make no sense otherwise. What the hell are you so afraid about? Nothing's happening, dude. Why are you so jumpy? I mean, that's just a piece of trash on the road. Why the heck did you swerve? What's wrong with you? That piece of trash in Afghanistan could have been hiding a bomb or an explosive device. People behind you, that crowd, could contain a suicide. Bomber. You don't like crowds, and so forth. So, now I told you, those messages go down to the maintenance dude. So what does the maintenance dude do? Well, he takes care of all the stuff in the building. The plumbing, the sound, the, the electricity, the elevators, all that stuff. Let's go back to our example in Afghanistan. Here's a sound. Oh, what is it? The downstairs responds. The amygdala starts the process going. The hypothalamus gets the message and starts making all the things happen. And they happen, by the way, through the maintenance dude. So our heart starts to race. Why does our heart race? It races because you may have to run or uh, fight. You may have to do something. So your large muscles need a lot of uh, blood. So your heart pumps so there's more oxygen, more blood for your big muscles. Your eyes dilate. Why do your eyes dilate? Well, you want to see everything going on around you. Uh, you, may, uh, you may get nauseated in your stomach. Why? Because your stomach contents are being pushed out or changed so that if, God forbid, something sticks in you, there's less in your stomach to cause infections all over your body. A and you may get goosebumps. You may feel cold. Why? Because the blood is going away from your skin, so more of it can circulate to your brain and to your heart where it's needed. All those things are understandable during stress. 
Now let's talk about what happens. Now you're on the streets of San Antonio and something happens that brings up a thought. It brings up a memory that the hippocampus has. Why does the hippocampus have to record everything? Because if you're ever in that situation again, your brain wants to know about it so that you can prepare. So now you're in San Antonio and you hear a loud noise, amygdala works, heart races, all the stuff, you get startled, etc. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what PTSD is. At its core, it is a biologic condition with emotional, behavioral, and psychological consequences. Why wasn't it called a biologic condition to begin with, do you know? It wasn't found in DSM before 1980. What happened, what ended in 1975? Vietnam. In order to code for those people coming back from Vietnam so they could get help, the American Psychiatric Association went uh, into action. They looked at the symptoms. Symptoms all looked uh, uh, psychological, behavioral, emotional, and it was put in DSM as a psychiatric condition. The reason I emphasize that is people with DSM don't want to be thought of as crazy, and they're not. They don't want to be thought of as weak-willed, and they're not. They want to be thought of as they are. People who have experienced a severe trauma that the body responded to, and how did the body respond? It responded just like it was made to do. Because you see, PTSD is a distortion and prolongation of a process that's intended to protect us from harm when we're threatened. The problem is, it's a distortion. It happens in time when not much is happening. And it's a prolongation. It can last for months. By definition, it has to last at least a month. It has to cause some distress and impairment. But it's, it's a prolongation of a process that was originally given to us to protect us from harm. And the end result is it causes us to react as if we were being threatened when no such threat exists. And at its core, that's what PTSD is. So what are the symptoms of PTSD? We're going to talk about them in the workplace in just a moment. But I'm going to go through the four core areas of symptoms. In DSM-4, there were only three. But DSM-5 is better, so there are now four symptom classes. The first class is called intrusive recollection. What that means is unwanted thoughts. And those thoughts can come when you're wide awake in terms of just recollections, remembrances of what went on. Uh, it can occur in sleep. That's what a nightmare is. It can occur when your brain kind of goes back to where it was during times of your trauma. So uh, a flashback, that's what a flashback is. A flashback is like a nightmare when you're wide awake. A flashback is like a nightmare when you're not asleep. It's more than just remembering stuff. It's actually reliving it. So people with flashbacks are here, but they're not really here because their brains may well be somewhere else. And there are triggers that cause all those things. And the triggers might be a smell, a sound, a sight, a temperature, a date, the presence of too many people, whatever it might be, those may be triggers. So that's the first cluster of symptoms. The second is called avoidance. Avoidance means you don't want to talk about it. Not only don't you want to talk about it, you don't want to think about it. You don't want anybody else to talk to you about it. I'll talk about that in the workplace in just a minute. You don't want to talk about it. You don't want to think about it. You don't want to go to places that remind you of it. You don't want to be in activities that remind you of it. 
Then there's a new category in DSM-5. That's called negative thoughts and emotions. Negative thoughts and emotions. The emotions involve things like detachment, not wanting to be close to people anymore, not wanting to socialize, even sometimes with your own family. And many of you who know veterans understand that. Uh, they, they may want to be distant from others. They may not laugh and smile very much. They have mostly negative emotions. So instead of smiling and being happy and being loving, they're either nothing or sometimes it's negative. Now, none of these are deal breakers in the workplace, and I want to really emphasize that. We can deal with all of these things. And the final cluster is called increased arousal. So arousal is what we usually think of with PTSD. What's arousal? It might be things like being easily startled, being jumpy, a loud noise, and people jump. And sometimes they do things that embarrass them. So I've had people, you know, after Vietnam, you know where the term going postal comes from? So after Vietnam, uh, veterans couldn't get jobs. They had preference in three areas. One was civil service, second was law enforcement. You want to guess where the third one was? Post office. So there are thousands of Vietnam vets in the post office. And the unions were so strong and the supervisors had PTSD too and they put up with their stuff. So they never caused any problems. But I've had vets who tell me, you know, some of my fellow employees, they thought it was cool. They would take a tray of mail and drop it on the ground just to see me hit the ground, hit the deck. That's uh, being easily startled. The second is called hypervigilance. That's always looking around, not wanting anybody at your back. That's the name of our book. When I ask people uh, what, what kind of worries you about your environment, they said, uh, I, I'm worried about other people. And I said, so let's say you go into a restaurant, it's pretty empty, little sign says sit everywhere, anywhere you want. Where do you sit? And they say, duh, I always sit with my back to the wall. And that's the thing. I'll talk about that in the workplace. So now let's talk about how do we overcome these stumbling blocks? If we understand them, how do we deal with them? And by the way, is it worth it anyhow? to hire these guys and gals for the workplace. So let's talk about some reality facts first, because that's what's important. We've got to educate the workforce, the CEOs, the HR people, fellow employees, and society in general. PTSD can occur to anyone who is involved in a particular type of trauma when your life is threatened, uh, your integrity is threatened, they've added uh, sexual abuse for those uh, children who were sexually abused when they were much younger and so forth. So under a particular kind of stressor, and it could be a rape, a fire, a flood, a hurricane, uh, a shooting, an automobile accident, so there's a lot of people in the workplace with PTSD who were never in the military. And they may have PTSD just the same as others. So PTSD is a response to a stressor. The data shows from the RAND Corporation, a study done not many years ago, that it only occurs in 20 to 30% of those in combat, in combat. And there are many other ways, by the way, that one in the military can get PTSD other than combat. For example, a cook I saw said, Doc, I'm a cook. I don't even carry a damn weapon. I cook. I cook. But that mortar coming over the side, blowing up not 100 yards from our tent, didn't know that when it blew up. Did he develop PTSD? Yes, he did. Did he see other people injured? and hurt and actually killed, yes, he did. But only 20%. Some of those 20% have had emotional problems before they went into the military. Others did not. 
the severity of PTSD, as you asked, is it all the same? Is it like pregnancy? You either are, you aren't. No, is the answer. There is mild PTSD, moderate, severe, very severe. So not everybody who has PTSD suffers from the most severe type of PTSD, and I think that's important to know. PTSD does not negatively have to affect the workplace if we understand it, we go into the process with open eyes, we help our fellow man out, and we make accommodations sometimes that are needed. And the final thing I want to mention down there, because this is a misperception, there is help available for PTSD. PTSD is not a hopeless condition. The good news is people can get past it and live meaningful and productive lives. And then again, I want to reinforce that PTSD is at its core a biologically driven illness or problem or trauma or whatever you call it uh, that has behavioral, emotional, and psychological consequences. It also has physical consequences. By the way, PTSD, remember I told you your heart races? What's normally supposed to happen in the body after a trauma is there's something called cortisol, which is a hormone put out by your adrenal glands that, that's supposed to help during times of extress, extreme trauma. And then when the trauma's over, there's a negative feedback loop, kind of like a, a thermostat on an air conditioner, and it senses that there's too much cortisol and it shuts down the hypothalamus from doing its thing. And PTSD, that does not happen. And so the body continues to produce cortisol at times when it shouldn't. What happens? The blood pressure stays up. So high blood pressure is common in those with PTSD. Heart disease is more common. Diabetes is more common. Obesity is more common. And there are a lot of conditions that are the result of PTSD. Now let's talk briefly about the symptoms of PTSD. So let's say you have somebody in the workplace that is doing their work just fine, but they're moved now, and the place they're moved to has a lot of people milling around. Can that cause PTSD symptoms? Sure it can. Remember, I told you, all those people, people don't like crowds of people sometimes. And that may serve as a trigger. So might certain kinds of noises. So what can we do about that? Well, if you understand it, maybe the working arrangement can be changed. Maybe the person can wear earphones with white noise to block out some of the, the startle causing noise and the like. Avoidance, real story. I ask a veteran, so what makes you more upset than you should be at work? And he says, he says, uh, you wanna know? I said, yeah. He said, I'm, I'm working, I'm doing a good job, I'm minding my own business. And this other guy comes up and he says, so, I hear you were in Iraq. What was it like in Iraq? Seems like a simple enough question. I said, so what happened? He said, I said, don't you have something to do? Get the hell away from me. All of a sudden he's identified as having an anger management problem. What he was responding to is the avoidance symptoms of PTSD. He didn't want to talk about it. Now, the fellow employee didn't know that. He didn't do it uh, maliciously. It just happened. But without understanding, it could cause a problem. Negative thoughts and emotions. So the party's coming up for the department. It's a big deal. Everybody's excited about the party coming up for the department, except the veteran. Not only is he not excited, he ain't about to go. And when he doesn't show up, the rest of the employees say, what the hell's wrong with that guy? Well, what, is he stuck up? What's wrong with him? You know, 
And, and they don't understand socializing, lack thereof, may be one of the symptoms of PTSD. Again, these are not big deals if they're understood. Somebody tells a joke, everybody laughs, but the veteran doesn't laugh. What's wrong with him? Doesn't he have a sense of humor? What's wrong with him? Doesn't trust anybody. That's one of the symptoms of, of negative thoughts. Feels guilty about stuff. Feels depressed. Increased arousal. So there is a meeting called. Uh, the veteran moves to a new department. There is a meeting called, and the meeting table is a large table that extends out, and everybody sits at the table. But the wall is 10 feet back that way, and the veteran refuses to go to the meeting. What's wrong with you, dude? He doesn't want to sit where he doesn't know who's got his back, that his back is covered. Now, all these are easily overdone, overcome things if you understand. And I want to mention this one because it's very misunderstood. We all know irritability, agitation can be part of PTSD. By the way, shooting up the workplace is not part of PTSD. Workplace violence is so rare, it almost always makes the news. It is not common. It is not common, and I want to emphasize that, but irritability may be. So it can be a symptom of PTSD, but it can also be a demonstration of what we call cultural issues. Let me give you an example. So what makes you upset at the workplace more than it should? And by the way, all the symptoms of PTSD have to, be, have to represent a change from what the person experienced before the trauma. So it's not that they were always an ogre, it's something changed because of the trauma. What makes you more upset than it should? You wanna know? You wanna know? I'm gonna tell you, here it is. They called a meeting for two o'clock. I showed up at 10 minutes till two. You know what time the other gomers showed up? You know what they showed up? 2.15, 2.20, so I told them, what the heck is wrong with you? Don't you know you're supposed to be on time? Now, he's just been hired by the company. And his supervisor says, look, dude, not that big a deal. Cool it, not that big a deal. Now, it would be easy to assume that's from PTSD, but in his case, it was not. It's just a cultural difference. In the military, a meeting is called for two. You show up at 10 minutes till two or you're late. You never show up after that. The manual says you do one, two, three, four, and five, and in the workplace, not so much. They may do five, they may do three, they may do two, they may do four, and the veteran is saying, you don't do it that way. Why? Because in the military, you do it the right way or somebody can get hurt or killed. But in the civilian world, maybe not so much. Some of that involves retraining and accommodation. So let's talk about that. The first is, you gotta educate. If your company wants to hire veterans, or is already, you wanna get as much good information out there as possible, so you don't buy into the myths and misconception. You wanna get good information out, and, and give that to fellow employees. One of the things I'm working on now, through the VA survey, is helping EAPs to dispense that information to the company wanting to hire vets. If there are specific symptoms and you're allowed to talk, and I realize all of the legal stuff, I've, I've been educated about that now, what you can say, what you can't say, and so forth. But there are adjustments that can be made. For example, not sleeping well at night is common in PTSD. So uh, the workplace starts at 7.30, they get there at 7.30, but they're dragging and drooping. If there's a possibility that that person might come in at nine and work two hours later to make up for it, no problem, it can be overcome. And, and the white noise things, 
If there's a party that has to be attended, maybe suggesting to attend that party with another veteran. And the two of them together can do what the one of them alone cannot do. There's a lot of suggestions, and I'll give you a website to go for that. Show respect and caring for the folks there, especially, by the way, if they say, I I'm getting treatment. A great approach is, I'm so excited for you, I'm so proud of you that you're admitting uh, that, that uh, things are not going well and you need treatment and so forth. Maybe allowing time to go to those appointments. The, the business may have that flexibility, the VA usually does not. And so they have to go when they have to go. But if they can go, it can be a win-win for both the business and uh, the uh, veteran. The big thing now is peer support, having other veterans help the veteran. So for example, that two o'clock example, you know, the, the vet can talk to other peers and they can say, look, I went through that just like you did. Let me explain the civilian workplace to you. The cultural differences between where you've been and where you are now. Mentoring having someone who's been longer in the company help those who have just started. And the big deal now is called affinity groups. So an affinity group could be within the organization, a group of veterans. It can be within the community, a group of veterans. Uh, it can be on the web, a group of veterans, and so forth. And those can be very helpful. And then finally, the EAP. I could talk to you for an hour about the EAP, but I won't. So is it worth it? You bet it is. The SHRM survey, and, and this is cool. I've given you a reference to this. This is called Support from Behind the Lines, and you'll have a link to it on, on the website. It says that those companies that hired veterans found out one, they had a very strong sense of responsibility. Two, they knew how to work as part of a team as long as they understood the layout of the land and the rules. Number three, they acted under pressure with a high degree of professionalism, just like we'd expect them to. They had the ability to see a task through to its very end and, and to work incessantly on it. They showed strong leadership and problem-solving skills. And these are actually survey results from businesses, not something I've made up. So the benefit of hiring vets, diversity in the workplace, a la this conference, and veterans bring of so much to the workplace in terms of diversity, increase in talent, and maturity of the workforce, and at the end, increased productivity and success of the organization, if, if it's done right. And in the process, we repay the gratitude to those 1% of Americans who, who fight and serve elsewhere for us. But to make it a good idea, one, you have to hire veterans for the right reasons, not the wrong ones above. The business has to understand, accept, and have a real game plan for how are we going to utilize these vets. See, I'll, I'll, I'll share a secret with you. One of the things that worries me about the let's hire vets deal that's big right now is all the emphasis is on the hiring part. There's very little emphasis on what do we do once we get them hired? How do we help them succeed and move forward and benefit the business? And I'm worried that unless we deal with that and the potential stumbling blocks, what's likely to happen is the company's likely to say, look, we tried that, didn't work. Don't think we'll do that next time. I don't want that to happen. There has to be a game plan. There may be uh, accommodations that are necessary and again in the uh, in the uh, website I'm going to give you something that gives you a full list of possible accommodations when do you make the move to hire the vets 
The answer, I hope, is now. You gotta do something. So let me share a brief story. I had a heart attack 15 years ago. I had double bypass surgery. I went to cardiac rehabilitation. That's where they hook you up to the machines and you do little exercises and the nurse can see. There were 10 of us in our group and we went for 12 weeks and every week they would talk about the diet. You need diet in addition to other things. So we all collected diets and, and we brought every week dutifully. We brought a new diet we had ripped out of a magazine or printed off from the computer. And pretty soon, the, the folder of diets was that thick. Nobody ever ate that damn stuff, but <laughs> we collected the diets. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not enough to know what to do. You gotta start somewhere. A and I really hope that today may be the start of that somewhere. So, I've got all these websites, you can't see them, don't worry, you don't have to, but they're on our website. And here's our website, it is called mybacktothewall.com. Mybacktothewall.com. And you see there's a wall up at the top and then there's a group of icons underneath it. If you press on the dollar sign, workplace, cool, huh? If you press on the workplace, you can get a list of all of the things that I've prepared for you that I think might be of value. And, and they're hyperlinks, so all you gotta do is click on it and print it all out. Everything I've put there is in the public domain, so you needn't uh, worry about it. So in review, PTSD is a biological condition. Technically, it is a psychoneuroendocrine disorder. Two, it is the result of a severe and life-threatening trauma. trauma. Three, symptoms and effects can be controlled if not totally cured. In much the same way, if you have severe diabetes, you may not be able to cure it, but you can live a good life, a satisfying and productive life, if you take care of yourself, PTSD the same way. Veterans with PTSD in the workplace can be reliable and valuable members of the organization. Let me repeat that. Veterans, even those with PTSD in the workplace can be reliable and valuable members of the organization. There may be actions required to best hire and retain and remember the successfully retained part. But if you do it, it can be well worth the effort. I, I'm gonna close with a little story. So I've been in practice a long time, since dinosaurs roamed the earth, I think 35 years actually. And I remember, I, I, I periodically will see people and I don't know, did they see me on TV? Was that a patient? Was that one of our research patients that I saw only briefly? And a guy like that came up to me on the street. And he said, Dr. Croft, Dr. Croft. And I said, yeah. He said, uh, I, I was one of your patients. And I just wanted to thank you. I just wanted to thank you. And when I saw him, I thought, I wonder what I said it was so brilliant, so overwhelming, so important that I really helped this guy. So I usually ask, and I did so, what, what happened that you found to be most valuable? Well, it actually wasn't a moment of brilliance or a statement that I made or a profound thought that I shared with him. He said, you probably don't even remember. He said, but our last session as I was standing up and walking to the door, you put your hand on my shoulder and you smiled and you gave me that little wink of yours and you said, hey, I've heard you, I know you, I believe, in fact, I know you can make it. Now get out there and go for it. 
wasn't the big thing I thought it was, but it demonstrates what all of us, all of us can do. Leo Buscaglia said, don't ever underestimate the power of a touch, of a smile, of a listening ear, of a belief in a person, because these seemingly little things may be enough to turn a life around. Thank you very much for letting me talk to you today.